today's message, we're continuing in chapter 5 with the second half of that chapter, 21 to 23. So when I was reviewing this, I'm going, okay, this is a difficult topic. Like when you, when you look at that passage of scripture, it's a difficult topic to navigate in this day and age for, for, for sure. And um, this is a topic that has been uh, maligned, I guess. The word of God has been maligned in many cases, and it's become something that it was never intended to be. And we're going to talk a little bit about all that today. But to start with, I, I just want to set the, the, uh, the context and the, and the background to this particular passage of Scripture. I think it's really important for us to understand um, the background to this and what leads up to this so that we can see what God's saying in this passage. So, as you guys are aware, Jesus Christ, our Lord, he was arguably the greatest leader in the history of the world. And um, even secular uh, scholars would say, yeah, he was a great leader. But, you know, when we look at the, the books of history, there are more books written on the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ than on any other leader in the world combined. Like, there's so much written about our Lord. While the Lord walked among us, he, he often tried to teach his disciples about the nature of leadership from God's perspective. He taught them that the ideal of leadership is, to being a leader, is, is not to throw your weight around or to become great at another person's expense. As their leader, G Jesus demonstrated to them by example how they were to lead. And one of the greatest lessons he taught them, if you recall reading the Gospels, was when the Lord stooped down with a, uh, a basin of water and he began to wash his disciples' feet. It's one of the greatest lessons. He, he taught them that the greatest person was the one who used the authority given to them by God to build people up, not to lord it over them. It was apparent that his disciples, however, after all of this teaching that Christ gave, and there's various places throughout the New Testament where we see Jesus trying to teach this both directly and indirectly, through example, he tried to teach them this, but they still struggled with this principle. After all his demonstrations of servant leadership through the ministry that he uh, lived while he was walking here, at the Last Supper, we see that the disciples were, were, were still arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Isn't that human nature? Well, but Christ, Christ, after the Last Supper, demonstrated his love for us, even though we were sinners, he died for us. He willingly gave his life for us. We didn't deserve God's love, but he still did it anyways. As our creator, God could have just said, okay, I'm coming up with another plan. Start over again, reset. He could have done that, but he didn't. As our creator, Jesus didn't didn't have to do what he did for our, our sake. But he was the model of true leadership and headship. And he brought atonement to us, made us at one with God through the work that he did on the cross and rising from the dead. Now, let's look back further. Okay, When God created human beings... He created us in his image. The Bible says that he created us in his image. Now, in Latin, the term for being created in the image of God is imagio deo. And you often, if you're in Christian circles studying the subject, you'll often hear them referring to this. It has this um, flavor that human beings are, are the crown of God's creation on the earth 
And we're the only ones in the creation with the honor of being created as his image bearers. And in the beginning, Adam and Eve um, were given this imagio dio, this character uh, in, the, in the footsteps of God. This, and, and when humanity fell, you know, the story of, of them eating the fruit from the middle of the tree when God said, no, or you will die, right? When they fell into disobedience and, and they sinned against the Lord, the stamp of God's image was still there, but it was marred and, and, and it was distorted from, from it, the pure intended uh, image that God wants people to reflect. You know, being made in the image of God means in part, okay, means several things. That we are designed to communicate with our Lord, our Creator, and have an interactive and intuitive and nurturing uh, relationship with Him. And, and we have this God-given ability like no other creature on earth. I mean... You know, some creatures are fairly intelligent, but they don't have that same ability. God made us to have a spiritual relationship with Him, the ability to connect with Him spiritually. But in the beginning, we see that sin broke that relationship with God. The second quality of being made in His image was that God also made us to be caretakers on the planet. Here on the earth... Um, that God is the sustainer and He's the provider of life. And, and we reflect on His sovereignty over all creation. The Bible makes it very clear that He is sovereign over all things. But God has created us to participate with Him as humans to care for everything that He's made. He invites us to partner with Him in that. So what happened when sin came into the equation? Sin also broke our relationship, marred our relationship with the created world. And there's a third way that God made us in his image. And God also made us in, a, us in his image with the capacity to, to care for and to love other people. And through our compassion for others, we express God's love for people. Through living with each other in humility and patience, we model God's mercy. By being generous with others, we demonstrate God's grace through friendships, through parenting, through leadership, and a host of other relationships that there are. We have the honor of showing others a reflection of what God is like. And like the other two ways that God made us in His image, sin has marred and distorted this. Sin is broken the relationship that God desires people to have with one another. And this is where the church comes in, friends. See, Jesus came as our creator. You see, the Bible says that he was the word, the living word of God, and that he created the whole universe. He is God in the flesh, and, and he came as our creator to serve us, to free us, to bring us into close relationship with God, when we ask Jesus to become our Savior, we become part of God's holy family. Jesus is our leader. He's the one that is at the head of the family. And as a family, we willingly submit to his headship over us. Now, the church is comprised of people. I had someone the other day at the Legion tell me, he says, well, this is my church. I'm like, mm, it's not the church. Because his understanding of the church is like a, a building with steeples and stained glass windows and all that. That's his idea of the church. And to him, that's not where he wants to be. He'd rather be, you know, having a beer with his buddies in Legion Hall. You know, kind of like that, uh, that old sitcom, I, you know, everyone needs a place to go or whatever. I can't remember the name of the show, but it was an old one, and, and for those of you who are younger, you might not remember it. What, what was it called? You guys remember? Cheers. cheers, yeah, yeah, cheers. That's right. So he, he kind of looks at church as cheers, right? But, uh, but that's, not, that's not the church. The church is comprised of all of God's children 
who have surrendered to Jesus Christ the lordship of their hearts and have asked him in to be their savior. And working together, he's given each one of us different gifts to work together so that the world can see truly imagio dio, what God is like, what it is like for a human being to be fashioned in his image. Creating a multi-ethnic body that's created in his image and, and lives out the culture of the kingdom in the greater community in a world that's filled with darkness. And, and, and God wants us as his image bearers to represent him to a broken world, a world that is filled with brokenness. And, and that's why Paul, in our text this morning, starts off with what, I'm, what we're going to read. The first verse of, of our text this morning in 21, Paul says this, he says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's how he starts all of this off. So in context with where we're going to be going in this passage, Paul has been speaking to the church in Ephesus about practical ways in which true believers can express being filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 21, he continues and he brings out another um, way that we can express that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. He brings out this principle of mutual submission. Now, as a Christian, this means that I am being encouraged here to put someone else and their needs above my own needs. I, I'm not just to do this for personal benefit, for something I can get out of the deal, but I'm to do this out of reverence for Christ and the gift of grace that he's given me. When Jesus taught his disciples about how God desires that we treat another, one another, he told him that when we serve others meeting their needs, we are actually also serving him. Some people equate serving God to doing all kinds of stuff you know, in the church, and, and yes, it is true, that is serving God, but th that's kind of where the limitations are. It's kind of like we have our church service where I'm, I'm serving you with the word of God, and others are serving you with... Uh, with music ministries to engage uh, you so that you have the opportunity to, uh, to call out to God from a heart of joy. That, that's all service of God. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not. But, but it goes further than that. Um, God, God's desire is that in serving Him, we meet others' needs. And in Matthew 25, it's it's actually a great scripture that talks about this. Um, in Matthew 25, 35 to 40, Jesus tells this story of how things are going to go when he returns and executes judgment on the people of the world. One day Jesus is going to come back as judge. And he is going to make judgment on how things um, are in this world. And and um, I, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but from verse 34 to 36, I think it's important for us to understand this. Then the king, Jesus said this, then the king will say to those on his right, this is when he is having all the people before him in judgment, he will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And what does he say? For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and, and you invited me in. I, I needed clothes, and, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And it goes on where the person is surprised. Well, when did we see? He says, you do this unto the least of me. You, you do this unto me. See, th this, is, this is leadership. This is true leadership. You want to be great in God's kingdom? The Lord says, 
that we need to learn to be the servant of all. I mean, as Christ loved the church as Christ loved us, so we must love one another, not just by what we say, but by how we treat others, by how we engage with others, how we meet their needs. In the spirit that, that Christ displayed when he poured out his life for us, we're to be imitators of him, to be image bearers of him in submission to what we would desire for ourselves, to put other people's needs above our own, to sacrificially give so that they are taken care of, even if it means a, a significant personal cost to us. This is... This is God's desire that his church understand this. And this is what he was trying to teach his disciples all the way through the New Testament. And they didn't get it, even at the Last Supper. Who's going to be the greatest? That they're all about me. What I can get out of this. Now, it's in the spirit of submission for all believers to one another that Paul continues. See, if we're going to be the imagio dio, the image of God to the world, we need to love the people that are around us with the love of Christ. That means loving one another in the church, but also reaching our hand out to those that don't know him, who don't know their spiritual right hand from their left, that are just stumbling around trying to find sense in this world outside of God, we have the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. We know this as believers. He's changed us. And if you don't know him, you can come to know him. He is so good. But Paul moves on. And, and if we're going to be the image of God to this world and to love the people that are lost and to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life, then, then the image of God also needs to be stamped on the core relationships that make up the church. And, and what is the most central relationship to the human family? The, central, the centerpiece of the human family, and the centerpiece also of the church is the marriage relationship because the children come from that marriage relationship and they're the generation, they're the future of the church. You see all these children here. They are our future. We need to pour into them. We need to invest in them. And, and, and the marriage relationship is at the core of that. This is why Paul specifically desires to illustrate God's perspective on the marriage relationship from verse 22 to the end of the chapter and correlate that relationship with his relationship to, with the church. You know, out of many scriptures in the Bible, the passage that we're about to get into here today have crea has created um, a whole host of different feelings and tensions. I believe this is because with many people's life experiences, the image of God has not been reflected well in the marriage relationship because of the marring of sin. And it may be our own sin. It may be the sin of a spouse. Maybe both. But marriages are marred. And we're going to discuss this passage this morning with hope that clarity will be given in a manner that's pleasing to God and that reflects his image from us as a church. So Paul writes, reading from verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now the church, as the church submits to Christ... So wives should also submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, 
After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are all members of his body. So in conjunction what we have read leading up to this in verse 21, where all believing people, including men, are called to be submissive to each other out of reverence for Jesus. And when we consider the, exa- the example that Jesus le- uh, led by with his own disciples, see, Paul, Paul, Paul explains here that there, there is a God-ordained roles in the Christian marriage that are to reflect the roles of the relationship between Christ and the church. But these, these roles are only found um, to express the image of God, the imagio dio, when both husband and wife are functioning properly, working together in harmony to accomplish the purpose of bringing glory to the God in the world. Now, I realize that what I'm about to speak about here today is God's ideal. We live in a broken world, don't we? And many of us have taken hits. Many of us have been hurt by sin. I want you to know that um, when one person or another in a marriage deviates from God's ideal, that brokenness, uh, we have to understand, is something that's very difficult for people to overcome. It's very difficult. But today, I want you to know this, that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. No matter where you've been, no matter what's happened to you in your life, how you've been broken, how you've been crushed, maybe it's partly your fault, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a combination of you, maybe it's all your fault. But the fact of the matter is, once the breaking occurs, there's broken pieces to pick up. And, and I want you to know today that there's grace for you. There is healing for you. Regardless of your circumstances, God is able to mend the broken pieces of your heart and make you whole again. I want, that, I want you to understand that. That's scriptural. Okay? What Paul is laying out here is the ideal so that the Christian church can be the imagio dio to the world outside. And yes, he does desire us to function within his planned purpose. Because that's how we function best. God created us. He's the designer. He wrote the manual on how we operate best. The manual is found in the Word. And we need to trust the Word. We need to rely upon the Word. So, here in Ephesians, he recognizes, Paul recognizes, the importance of healthy marriage relationships in conjunction with God's plan for the church. He wants our marriages to be an example of his grace at work within humanity. A good marriage where both husband and wife are working together to glorify God. That is a powerful thing. A powerful witness to a selfish world. And it shows how a Maggio Dio works. What we are to be made in the image of God. And in this world, everyone's fighting for power. Isn't it true? Look at the news. Look at everything that's going on. People are fighting for power and control over others. Where men and women are constantly fighting over his or her rights. The church is in the world and sometimes we get hit and sometimes we're affected by it and sometimes we allow the world to creep in. And the results are fracturing and there needs to be healing and and restoration. The roles that are played between Christ and the church are paralleled to the ideal relationship between a husband and a wife. So let's talk about this. 
And my Bible makes it abundantly clear, both in this passage and other passages through the Scripture, that the Christian husband's role in a marriage relationship is to lead. It's written in 1 Corinthians 11.3, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. The husband's God-given role is to lead. And I know out there that there is this marred understanding of what leadership is in comparison to what God's ideal is. See, for man to lead in his relationship as a husband, he is leading in such a way that he is conforming to the image of God. He is to love his wife and care for her as though she was his very own body. Just as Christ washed his disciples' feet, as, as we mentioned earlier, God, God desires that the husband in leading gives of himself sacrificially to his wife to see that she has every opportunity to blossom into everything she was meant to be as a woman. That's your call, man, as husbands. It's not about me. It's not about how she can serve my needs. It's about how I can pour myself out to make her better, to lift her up, to fulfill God's purposes, to, to help her fulfill God's purposes for her as a woman created in His image. You know, too many times this passage on submission has been taken out of context and put out there wrongly. It's become a tool. It's become a tool for men to have power and control. And men who are pursuing uh, a, self, a selfish and self-fulfilling life. And that's wrong. Leadership is all about servanthood. You know, with leadership comes responsibilities. I would venture to say, you know, the Bible even talks about it. Like as a pastor, I'm a, I'm a teacher of the flock of Christ. It's a role that God has given me and a gift that he's given me to do. But it doesn't make me any greater than anybody with a different role in his in his church. But it does mean that I have more responsibility before him. And it does say that some, we shouldn't be, you know, eager to be teachers, you know, like, or it shouldn't be something that we're like, oh, I want to be a teacher. It's because there is more responsibility on, on my plate before God because of the gospel and, and what it means to be a pastor. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying, like, there's people that are doing stuff in behind the scenes in the church that uh, the Bible says the least in this kingdom of God will be the greatest. And everybody has a part to play. You know, if you're, if you're uh, a toe in the kingdom of God in the church, right, you're just every bit as important as a mouth. But that's covered and you don't see it. And, but toes give you balance. Right? There's all these gifts that God's given. None, none are superior. But I'm telling you, role, role as, uh, the role as husband, God holds you responsible to a greater degree for your family than he does your wife. So take note of that, man. God has called you to servanthood, to serve and protect your family and to, and to give them... Um, the things that they need to thrive and to blossom in this world for Christ. That is the proper view of this. And so, so often it's been taken out of, out of context. And, and, you know, the world should look at our marriages and they should instantly see the difference. If we're following in obedience to Christ, if we're living in a way that pleases Christ, 
They should see a difference. They should see a Christian, a Christian husband tenderly and selflessly pouring himself out for his wife and for his family. Not some brute that stands in the corner and says, make me dinner, woman. Like, what is that? It has absolutely nothing to do with Christian leadership. As a, as a matter of fact, it's the antithesis of it. You see, if we get this according right according to Scripture, there's harmony, and it works. God knows it does. So, husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church, right? Gave himself for it. Wash the church so that it washes us, protects us, forgives us when we wrong them, each other. Like, when we want wrong each other, forgives us. When we wrong him, he forgives us for that, too. Like, like there's this relationship between Christ and his church that is beautiful. If you don't understand the grace of God, friends, you need to understand. The Lord poured himself out. The creator of the universe humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Why? So that you could have life. He took the stripes. By his stripes, we have been healed. Although, like sheep, we've gone astray, he's laid on a on, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. That's love. That's leadership. In the same manner, ladies, in a marriage relationship, you find yourself in, in a Christian marriage to be in a supporting role with your husband. And, and that's not, you see, that's not a role that is to be taken lightly either. And it's not, uh, it's just as important as your husband's role. And, and the consequences of getting it wrong, you see, the guy that goes, hey woman, make me dinner, that's the power and control model, right? Well, when you're oppressed, when someone does that to you, what does it make you feel like doing? It makes you feel like rebelling and getting out of that, right? And and saying, I'll show you, I can do that just like you can. I, I'll, I'll do it myself, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll be the, I'll be the, the leader. So, so you get this wrong, you know, it's like the superiority thing goes on. And it's not, it's, it's complementary. Being, being a helper and being a supporting role with your mar- in your marriage, it, it complements the leadership position, like, I was just talking with my wife, like, we get along really well, actually. <laughs> we do. I, I don't remember much in the way of any kind of conflict through, for many years, you know, like, yeah, there's been conflict when I've been a bullhead. And she's like, what smart not, you know, stop being a bullhead. Oh, Okay. You know, or, you know, I mean, she's, she's got her flaws, too. We all have flaws, right? And, we, and sometimes we sin, and we have to say, I'm sorry, I, I've done what was wrong. I haven't been a perfect husband. I have been far from perfect, been far from a perfect father, but God's teaching me. And, and in our role, we thought, you know, how, like, I, I'm just going to say it. I respect her intelligence. I respect her giftings and her abilities. And there's things that she does better than I do, and, and as... I recognize the spiritual headship that God has in me, as, as, as the scripture says. But I'm not going to say, oh, I, you know, I'm gonna, you're going to do everything I want you to do. And I'm not, I'm not going to ignore the giftings that God's given to her and permitted her to have. I'm going to encourage her and say, flourish in that, my dear. Flourish in your gifts. Go, go forth and honor the Lord with everything that he's given you to to, to work with, because that's, that's what it's all about, okay? And she, uh, uh, the woman in the relationship compliments her husband and as a team in a Christian, Christian marriage that's working as the ideal, they work together to display the image of God to a world that is warped and contorted in their understanding of relationships. In the world out there, it's all about what you can get, and it's about power and control, and there's this struggle going on and this battle between the sexes. No, in the Christian marriage, it's not supposed to be that way. It's, we're supposed to surrender to each other and, and look after the interests of each other, 
not just after our own interests. Man to woman, woman to man. That's the way, the way God intended it. It's one of the highly, most highly debated and most understood roles of being a wife in marriage is taking a role of submission to your husband. Well, when, when, when Paul says in verse 21, submit to one another, what, what does that mean? Well, it, it means taking a position of other-centeredness, of serving the other person's needs above your own. Well, and, and, and he continues with this as, as a reflection of the human relationship in an ideal marriage that, that is functioning according to God's design. Wives, submit to yourselves to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Do you suppose that it's easier to submit to someone if they're nice to you? Yeah. But ladies, this is between you and God. You need to understand that your husband might not be in the right place right now. And as, 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 a, as a woman, you need to, to encourage him to come along to the right. You need to encourage him. And you can do that by respecting him in the ways that he's doing things right. Encourage him. If he's doing something well, say, hey, honey, that's awesome. You're really doing this. I really appreciate it. Every person's got their flaws. And every person has their strengths. What I've said here, submit yourselves to your husband as fitting in the Lord. That's what the scripture says. This being said, submission has nothing to do with blind obedience or women being inferior to men. I want to repeat that. It has nothing to do with blind obedience or women being inferior to men. It has more to do with the wife entrusting herself to her husband. It goes hand in hand with the husband's role of leadership. In submitting, the wife gives her husband the opportunity to be the leader God wants him to be and to fulfill the role of her husband in the Christian marriage. This means the wife is called to revere, admire, and honor her husband. And a good, a good, a good um, Christian wife values her husband's opinions, admires the positive things in his values and in his character, and, he's consider and she's considerate of his needs such as the need for self-confidence and the need to be needed. Some tensions in marriage is because there's a spirit of criticism and cutting, and that, that's not God's way. Again, it does not mean that a wife should willingly go into sin if her husband is not leading rightly. If your husband is leading in sin... The Bible's not saying submit to that, and there's been so much false teaching over the years and so much harm done to, to ladies who have been abused and have been, it's just been horrible things that have happened, and they've said, well, I thought I was supposed to submit to my husband. I'm going to say this again. If your husband is leading into sin, you're to say no. You're to stand up against him. See, the passage isn't referring to that. If a husband sins and he wants his wife to sin along with him, she should resist his evil behavior and obey God rather than man. It's the same way with authority. Like if the authority tells you to do something that's w wicked, you obey God rather than man. It, in the marriage relationship, it's the same deal. Too many times, this has been taken out of context and become a tool for men to push evil things in their relationships and manipulate their, wa thing, their wives to do things that are wrong. And that's not just, you know, it's like, we're going to cheat on our taxes. We're going to da-da-da-da-da. On and on the list goes. It can be any, any kind of sin. And Christians aren't exempt. Sometimes we can allow the devil to gain a foothold in us, and we can be living in a way that's not pleasing to the Lord. And we expect our wife just to go along with that because she's supposed to submit to me. Nonsense. She is supposed to stand up against us and tell us when we are doing wrong. And ladies, don't be shy about that. Do it in a spirit of gentleness, but don't be shy about standing up when sin is on the, on the plate. There's an example of this in the New Testament. Well, what does the Word of God have to say about this? Everything we're talking about here, we need to filter through the Word of God. It's not just Pastor Clint's words here. right? Let's look at what the Word says. There's an example in the New Testament 
of God's judgment that fell on both husband and wife as a team because they were conspiring together to do evil and, and, and the, the, the result was catastrophic. Uh, in, in Acts 5, we're told of the story of Ananias and Sapphira. From time to time, people would sell their property and they'd lay it at the apostles' feet and say, here, use this for the common good of, of the church as, you, as God moves you. So, this was common. And in Acts chapter 5, 1 to 11, there is this husband, his name was Ananias. And, and uh, his wife was Sapphira. And, and they sold the property. They sold the property. And they wanted to look really good. So, they, so Ananias came uh, to the Apostle Peter and, and says, here is, the, here is the money from the sale of my property. And he did this publicly. Here you go. Here is the money from the sale of my property. Use it as you see fit. This is all, and he basically says, this is all of the money from the sale. And, and he was lying. They actually kept some of it back for themselves. But he was saying, here it is, it's all of it. Trying to look good, right? But lying. And, and it wasn't so much that they didn't have the right to retain some of that for themselves. It, 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 for sure they did, but it was the fact that they lied about it. And, they, and, and, and Ananias said, this is, the whole, this is the whole sum. What happened in that case? <laughs> God says, hey, you've not just lied to, uh, to Peter here in the church. You've lied to me. Boom. Ananias falls dead right there. He's struck dead. Serious business. Okay. Well, a little bit later, Anna, uh, Sapphira comes in, and she doesn't know about Ananias uh, and what he did and, where, and what happened to him. And they say, hey, is this the money that was from the sale of the property? And she says it's the same. She says the same thing as, her, she, as, as Ananias did. And, and what did God do here? Hey, I don't know about you, but in my life, there's been things that I've done in my life where I thought, shortly thereafter, I might be a pile of ash. Right? If we're honest, as human beings and living in a fallen world, we've done stuff that we probably don't deserve to live. Right? And when, when, when it comes to a holy God. So this is the case here. See, Sapphira, if she was acting in accordance with God's design, would have said to Ananias, you know what, Ananias? I know that you're the head of the house here and you... God's giving you that leadership, but you're leading in a very poor direction here. This is the wrong thing to do. And, oh, no, woman, you know. You I need to listen to me. Well, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I'm not part of this. You make that decision, that's on your, your, your head. That's not on me. I'm not having anything to do with this. That's what she should have done. But she didn't. She conspired with him to sin. So you see what I'm saying here? This idea of the woman should be submissive to her husband in all things. You have to take that into context. It's not talking about things of sin. How do you sin? How do, how do people sin? Sin? <laughs> so there's a lot of ways that we sin, right? A lot of ways. Lying, cheating, all that. Yeah, for sure. How about not doing the good things that we know we ought to do? Doesn't the Bible say something about that? That's sin too. So, you're in a relationship, and uh, you know you should be doing something, and the Bible says, don't do it, that's sin. And, and the scriptural principles say, yeah, I should be doing this. And I know the good that I ought to do, and I don't do it, that's sin. Okay? As a wife, if that's happening in your relationship, something's happening, and you know the good that you ought to do, and you're not doing it, you should speak up. Not just go. No. That's not God's design, and that's not what this is intended for. But when a wife submits herself to her husband and makes him better because she supports him in his leadership role and encourages him to serve Christ and be the leader that God designed him to do, she builds him up instead of tearing him down. It's a beautiful thing because that man becomes everything that God designed him to be as a leader. That's what Proverbs 31 is all about. And men... When you love your wives and you cherish your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, you, you're not going like this. You're going like this to your wife. You're lifting her up. And when the two are working in harmony, 
under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there is a magio deal. There is the image of God stamped and glowing and shining in all of its brightness into a dark world. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you are the light of the world. A light on a hill cannot be hidden. Therefore, shine your lights before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Husbands, you are the stewards of your family. Rise and be everything God has intended you to be. Love your wife with abandon, with reckless abandon. Serve her and serve your children. Serve them in a way that's honoring to God and you will shine. And your wife will have an easier time. She really will. And and ladies, you need to shine too. Be an encourager. Get rid of the malice and the critical spirit and the world. The Bible says be in the world, but be not of it. And that that goes into a whole a realm of different areas. Yet we're in the world. But as Christians, as a church, we're to be in the world and not of it. So this is time for analysis inside. I don't know what's going on inside. Only you do. This is between you and God. But his word is very clear here. And that's why it's been written the way it is. So, and one further point on this before we close. Just because it says, wives, submit to your husbands, and it says, husbands, love your wives, does not mean that husbands don't submit to their wives' wishes, and does not mean that men, that women do not love their husbands. Right? Just because the, the instruction to them is to, is to respect him does not mean that they're not also to love him. Right? So you see how this works together? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love one another as I have loved you. Submit to one another as Christ um, has submitted himself as a sacrifice for our benefit. So Paul ends this way. He says it this way. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. You see how he ends it? But I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And his wife must respect her husband. Amen.